David Luan, uh, founder of Adept, former OpenAI, former Google, uh, Sam Motamidi, Greylock investor, a board member at Adept, I believe, Snorkel, Cresta, Greylock's also an investor, and Tome, super excited. Yeah, where, where even to begin? Um, where, I mean, let, let's just, let's, let's start with Adept, right? I think that's like the best place to start. Can you just explain the product to people, right? I mean, this is not open for public release. I, in terms of my own thinking, I, I feel like we have this list of like foundation models. Do you put yourself in the foundation model category because you have a little bit of a different focus? If you could just walk people through that, I think that'd be super helpful. Yeah, totally. So, um, so for so for Adept, we are we're training our own foundation model, but we're not duking it out with the like OpenAI and Anthropics of the world that are sort of training LLMs or increasingly now these like multimodal based models that are sort of like general general uh, general general web stuff. I think that's going to be a really interesting space because people are going to like increasingly fight to have like more and more fungible like models that are going to be doing similar capabilities in that area. What we're doing at Adept is we're actually working on training a model that can do anything a human can do on a computer. So the goal is like teach this one neural network like how to use all software, how to use all, um, uh, all, all different tools that like someone on the machine would use every day. And ours is like specifically focused on making it really good for knowledge workers. And so, I mean, what was appealing to you? Like, how do you assess these companies? I mean, it feels like there, there's so many hot AI startups right now. Like, what? What's your sort of, what's the method here? Or like, what, what did you see in Adept? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with Adept and then maybe talk more generally. So, you know, I think Adept for us was a very, very easy decision. Like, if you take a step back, we believe one of the largest opportunities in software is to build usable general intelligence. And the way that expresses itself as a product is a co-pilot for every knowledge worker. That makes us 10 times more efficient and 10 times more effective. And we think to do that, you have to build a vertically integrated company, you have to build a multimodal model that understands how to learn from humans and then can operate across all software tools, and then you have to build all of the scaffolding that's required to actually operate that in real world enterprise environments. And that's exactly what Adept is doing. And David and his team are one of a very, very small set of people who actually have the operational understanding of how to scale these models from scratch. Um, and combined with that, they're extremely commercial and customer oriented. So Adept uh, was a very easy decision for us and we're fortunate that David selected us to be his partner. Um, more generally, Eric, I think the answer varies quite a bit based on the layer of the stack that you're operating at. So like, you know, we, we broadly think of it as applications and infrastructure. I talked about Adept as one example. But in general, when we look at the application layer, it's like the basics of software investing. You know, people talk about these AI companies like they're these magical creatures where different rules apply. And it's just not the case, right? Like, we look for companies that are focused on very specific customer problems, have a point of view on how they're going to own an, a valuable end user workflow, and where there's some gravity to the data that they're training on or operating on. And when we find those things, we get really excited to invest. But if you're just building a thin layer and you don't have any of those things, like, it's not something that's going to be a fit for us. And so what's the state of play in, with Adept today, like in terms of customers, like it's in, what do you call it, in beta? And like what, what can people do? And like what are, obviously part of the dream is that the use cases are sort of unlimited in terms of, you know, <laughs> anything a human can interact with a computer with graphically. Like, but what, what, what do you see people sort of putting it to use for? So right now we're at a point where we've got a bunch of really cool uh, enterprise partners that are really excited about Adept and working together on that. So we're working together with places like uh, like Workday and Atlassian and one more that we're going to sign and announce soon and Microsoft and, and, and some others. Um, and so like basically what, what's, what works really well with Adept right now is like, you know, if a human can do the thing on their computer and like a human can show the Adept model how a particular thing is done, we can just feed that into training and then now Adept will be able to do that again on Well, on like anything. an example that was given to me, I think this is real, is like Redfin. Or yeah, that was kind of our hello world thing. It's kind of funny. People are adopting Redfin as like the hello world browser control thing that they want to demonstrate. But like, I think a really simple example is like, like uh, you can like, uh, if you go find a bunch of LinkedIn's for someone that you want to hire for like, for like a job posting and say like, okay, now move all these people over to Greenhouse or like add them all to Salesforce as a new lead and like start a campaign. And you can put these down in text and because a model has learned, it's seen a lot of interactions with Salesforce, it's seen a lot of interactions with like general things on the web uh, um, and it has this context to be able to shuffle information around. It can do all sorts of stuff like that. 
that. But I think this is kind of like the like early table stake stuff. Like it's gonna be really helpful to knowledge workers who spend a lot of time like doing tedious stuff on their computer all day to like already have this level of capability. But I think where things get really exciting is when you like level up the uh, the like abstraction that you could do with models like this, right? Like maybe instead of just like doing that level of thing, maybe it's like just build me a whole financial model or like create a part for me in CAD and like optimize the hell out of it with a simulator. Like these are all things you should be able to do as the model sees more and more interactions between humans and computers. I mean the concern, or not concern, but just, you know, OpenAI came out with plugins and my understanding is there's a sense that like couldn't a company just like build a plugin instead of actually going through this like graphical sort of thought process or why like yeah i don't know just like help us understand why you think your approach is superior to like language based plus plugin i think one giant part is just looking at the success of things like like siri and like google home and stuff like that those are very like language in language out interfaces I think like there's a reason why we only trust them with a very limited set of things is because for the most part these giant models are not yet reliable, right? Like for the end user, like you want to be able to you want to be able to like like one there's like a tremendous amount of richness in existing interfaces that have already been created, right? Like it's the best way to consume content. It's the best way to like like see a lot of like visual stuff, right? And so uh, and similarly like because Adept does the thing for you on your computer. Um, you have a high amount of trust that it's actually like instead of it just spitting out, oh, the answer is 42, right? Like it actually like you can actually see. You like every play it step. back. You can see like the moves that it made. Exactly. Yeah. So I wish that like we could just like show some people right now. But like what it does is it like just actuates your actual machine to go get that. Thing and do I like it. just does it watch me do the activity and then it starts building from there? Or? You can do that. So we're working on a thing where you just hit the record button and you show adapt a workflow and then. And then when you hit stop record, you're like, I now could do this for these like next 16 things that I want to go do the same thing on. And so could it do like a spreadsheet level task like that? Or yeah, it works on spreadsheets and like other key knowledge worker tools. The what's 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 the Greylock relationship with OpenAI right now? Or like, I mean, obviously Reed, you know, was so early. He was on the board. He just stepped off the board. I interviewed him on my podcast. I mean, you all are investing super aggressively in these companies. I mean, this, this clearly competes directly with OpenAI. Like, what's, what's the relationship and like, what, what have you all learned from that, like working with them? Yeah, a as you point out, um, my partner Reed Hoffman was an early investor in OpenAI um, in the nonprofit foundation, was on the board until recently. At Greylock, we've been investing in AI for over a decade now. Um, both at the application layer and the infrastructure layer. Uh, we're, we're close to the OpenAI folks. We have a ton of respect for what they've done. A lot of our companies are partners with them in different ways. And at the same time, we believe AI is going to transform everything around how we work and live. And we're investing you know, with that thesis in mind. You know, I feel like with, with Adept, I mean, people read the headlines and I, they're here to sort of hear the headlines. Like, you know, the information had the story about some of your co-founders leaving. I think they've raised money from Thrive. Like, What's the backstory there? What's that mean for Adept? So I think this era of AI is like the period where I'm most excited about because I feel like, um, you know, for a long time we were just working on foundations, right? And then 2012 happened, we got AlexNet, and then 27 we had Transformer, uh, 2017 we had Transformers, but like it was this era from like, like nothing worked at all to this era where like, like it felt very much artisan like. It was like you and your three best friends could write a research paper that changes the world. And like that kind of became the dominant mode of AI progress. And I think once Transformer came out, we kind of had a lot of the core building blocks, right? Like the transistor has been invented. Like it's now really time to go build everything on top. And um, I like that line. Yeah, the, you, like your belief is like the core technology has been figured out. There's still a tremendous amount of research that needs to be done, but like the philosophy behind the depth, I think, is different from like what uh, what my old teammates were doing, and also like what like AI labs that are doing research are doing. Is like everything we do is ultimately in service of building this thing that everybody will use every day at work. Like and so like there's plenty of problems, like a lot of offline reinforcement learning problems that we're working on solving. Um, that like, but but and like we do tons of research, but it always flows back. And the, from, the like, subtext one here is that the people who left were more research focused, and you much see more you bottom up. Yeah, bottom up research, like very classic Google Brain type thing. And I think tremendous respect for like being able to do, to to go do that really well. Um, but it's a it's a it's like if you go think about like 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 we've entered the industrialization age of AI. Like it's now time to build factories. Like that's 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 the attitude. I'm curious across your other companies, like, you know, there's, I've, I've framed up this tension from the beginning, like foundation models versus research companies versus like product companies. Like, 
Do you have pure product companies? I mean, obviously, David has so much experience himself at OpenAI and Google, like, and is very technical. Like, but I'm curious, like, would you would Greylock invest in a pure product company, and how do you think of sort of those types of companies? Yeah, absolutely. I, I assume what you mean by pure product is. I know. More, I yeah, know. It's like yeah. a very. It's you know. You, you know. The, I mean, the sort of wrapper. Like, could you see a wrapper business being a successful startup investment? Yeah, I think it's very use case and vertical specific. Um, I, I'll give you a general framing for how I think about it, which is one of the questions we debate internally is where does AI turbocharge existing companies and existing workflows, and where is it a window for new companies to get built? So the lens I use is if you're going after a workflow that's already owned by somebody, and the way that AI incorporates into that workflow doesn't lead to a profound shift in the workflow, it fits more in the turbocharge model. So writing's a great example, right? Like, it turns out writing assistance is a great use case for AI. Um, Notion, Google Docs, and the rest have amazing editor experiences, and they can integrate AI in and offer those superpowers to their, to their users without needing a completely dramatically different workflow. That's, I'll contrast that with, like I saw Chris from Runway here earlier today, and you know what Chris is doing around video and content creation, sure, Adobe can like staple on text to asset creation onto their products, but he's reimagining that workflow from scratch for an AI, per, uh, like an AI first world centered around a natural language interface. And the product and experience feels completely different. Or like sometimes when people think of Adept, they think of, okay, RPA vendors, like UiPath and Automation right, Anymore yeah, yeah, and I the rest. Right, yeah, I initially thought that. Explain that, like I, I think people would like that disambiguation. Yeah, I mean, if you think about kind of the product mandate of we're gonna go automate a bunch of work and make people more efficient, and you ask who else has a similar product mandate, the RPA robotic process automation category has such a mandate. But if you go look at UiPath and the entire approach of deploying bots on these deterministic processes that are extremely brittle and not end user facing, and you compare that to the ergonomics and robustness of something like Adept that's powered by a natural language interface and can operate across different modalities with the end user in the loop, it's like a dramatically different workflow. And so it's very obvious to us why that's a new company versus an existing company. So we, we think about that lens when we evaluate application layer opportunities. We, we have invested in tons of application layer companies. You mentioned Tome and Cresta as other examples, but both of those companies kind of fit into that framework. Great. What, I'm, I'm curious about OpenAI and like the evolution we've seen with the company. I mean, in particular, like the shift from Nonprofit to like for profit. I'm curious, like, had that transition already happened when you were at OpenAI, or what? What cultural evolution, like, have you watched? Did you watch while you were there? I think the company changed dramatically. So I joined in 2017 to run engineering when there was only 35 people. Wow. And uh, <laughs> it was tiny, very very early days. Like teams hadn't really yet been like clearly pulled out of the ether. Um, and I think like. Like, honestly, during that time, like, it was not really clear what our unique, like, spot in the world was going to be. You know, like, we had some great researchers. We were kind of doing some, like, Google Brainy style work, but it was like, okay, is this just Google Brain SF? Like, it really was never meant to be that, right? And so I think what we did a really good job of was we, like, I think, realized, um, realized one of the first places to realize that, like, th like, that AI was changing, like, leaving this, like, you and your three best friends write a paper world and really entering the age of, like, when most ideas just start default working to like the 60 to 70% level, what you really want to do is you want to go like, you want to go like build a full research plus engineering team to swing for the fences on the, on the like technical outcome, not the scientific novelty. And so I think like that was sort of like phase one. I think that's what led to like a lot of early breakthroughs on the open AI side, including the robot hand work and, the, and some, of the, or some of the early GPT work as well. Um, but I think from there on out, like this, um, once the industrialization thing started staring us in the face more and more, like resourcing was going to be really, really important, and um, and I think that like that was behind a resourcing, lot of the, aka getting the money to found like compute, sending checks to Jensen, yeah, really. <laughs> so it's like um, so like that's the thing that you really, really had to do. Um, but then we got to this like new got to this new era where I think that like people, I'm sure everybody in the audience is fully realizing now, but like it's my strong belief that like if you want to build AGI regardless of how you define it, you need users and you need humans in the loop. And I think that like, and I think that now actually building a product company is the critical path to getting to general intelligence. Do you, yeah, do you, do you trust OpenAI still? Or do you, do you have like faith in them as sort of the carrier for this like huge cultural moment? Or do you, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to talk about the letter too much, but there's clearly anxiety with this pause idea. Like do you, do you think 
OpenAI, they're, they're good stewards of, of this future. Well, I think what's really interesting is, it, is that, um, is that like, so just due to how neural net scaling laws work, right? Like everybody's seen this stuff. Like our rule of thumb that we've, um, that we've learned from training large models at OpenAI and also at Google is you kind of need to be like two doublings ahead. If you, if you hold everything else constant, like data set, architecture, all that good stuff, literally all you're fighting on a scale, you kind of have to be two doublings ahead to be like materially more, to, for the model to feel materially more brilliant. And so I think this is both a blessing and a curse. And like when I was running the Google large models effort, I literally had a presentation where I was like, this is how we're going to win. This is also how we're going to get screwed. Um, because you're saying other people can catch up and they're not as far ahead as we believe. Because or what's you, the don't need, you don't need, um, you don't need orders of magnitude more resources, right? Because, because of the fact that you, if you're within a 4x factor, your models seem, uh, seem, if holding all else similar, like fairly similar in terms of how smart they are. And so I think what we're, I think what this year is really going to be, is is really going to show us is just proliferation. Like I think proliferation is the name of the game. And when proliferation is the name of the game, then like, then like uh, exactly what the front runner does, doesn't necessarily uh, steer the direction of the field as much as we think it like, would. Like this is a very competitive situation. Lots of people can catch up. Is that? That's fundamentally what you're saying. Also, just this amazing energy that we're seeing from the open source community. Like, right. like good stuff is happening. Like, we're like, it's also, we're starting to see this thing where, like, of course, the thing we care about most, and I'm just talking about LMs, not so much about Adept, but, like, for LMs, right, like, you, the, the, the tasks people are excited about are, like, higher and higher level ones, right? Um, but, like, a lot of these, like, lower level tasks on language, we're starting to see some saturation on the models, and I think that process is only going to increase. So there will just be more things people can reach for, and I think, um, and I think the fact that it's now in the hands of the community means that um, the pace of progress is just going to keep on speeding up. Are, are you seeing the rest of your portfolio, like non-generative AI companies, pivot in? And like, what advice are you giving people in terms of just like embracing this moment? And I don't know. Yeah, are you seeing people where it's a mistake to go in because? Yeah, it's not their specialty. Yeah, I, I, I'd say most of our portfolio, every single board meeting, there's a conversation around, should we be doing something around generative AI? Now, the, New, newcomers having that kind of... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the lens of that conversation is, how does it help us deepen the customer value we're driving, right? And so I'll give you an example. I'm on the board of a company called Apiro. It's an application security company. And so one of the things they do is they identify and prioritize vulnerabilities in code. Six months ago, we realized that we could leverage a bunch of the advancements in things like Codex to go beyond just vulnerability identification to automatically generating code to solve and remediate vulnerabilities. So that's an example of a company that didn't start as a generative AI company, owns a really valuable end user workflow, and then finds a way to turbocharge their customer value leveraging these models. Most of our enterprise-oriented companies have some story like that, but at the same time, like you know, I, I think it's important not to try to force it onto your product if it doesn't naturally help you further your customer value mission. I, I haven't talked a lot about like jobs today or job replacement through AI, though that's clearly on a lot of people's minds. And I, I feel like even though I don't know that Adept would be unique in sort of you know the threat to some people's jobs, I think the model where it's like, we can watch the worker, you do this thing, we figure out how to do it, we can do it, like it feels like a little scarier to me. Or, what, what do you say to people who worry about the job replacement? I'm sure you've thought about this at every company you've been at, but what, yeah, what's your thinking on the state of AI replacing people's quality jobs? Honestly, I think it's something that I think about a lot. I think it's definitely something that I am concerned about. I think that's actually a big part of like, look, like the adept mission is not actually, and I think it's gonna be really difficult to have all of these models literally replace jobs. I think what's more likely is I think it's just gonna give all knowledge workers a higher level interface. So that instead of spending, like for a salesperson, right, instead of spending like 30% of your week like dealing with updating Salesforce, you spend 1% of your week asking Adept to just do that for you, and you spend 99% of the time talking to customers, which is like really why you're, why you're doing this job to begin with. Like, I think that's gonna be the story that's gonna play out. It's gonna be really much more about like, the degree to which like, like the Industrial Revolution took away like, the need to go do a lot of like, like pure hands-on work that could be sped up. Like, I think it's just gonna take some of that, like, uh, some of the like, most tedious parts of everyone's job, the bottom part out. Do you, do you think it's mostly disruptive to white collar work at this point, or like, yeah? Do you, do you have? Are there like factory tasks that you you're able to do? For the most part, what we're doing is like because it's like really leverage for knowledge workers. It's like it's 
we do the low level stuff at the high, the, but the high level stuff is really all handled by like, like what should we do and why and how do I work with humans part is like, that's gonna be fundamentally human for a really, really long time. Um, the part that we're doing is like, is like handling like the like, like clicks and presses and types and form fills and like all that tedious crap that like, I don't think so anybody really signed I, up. So if I wanted to get Taylor Swift tickets, I could have <laughs> used this. Um, <laughs> webs it sounds like uh, yeah, ticket scalpers will uh, love this product. Um, the, uh, I mean, the, the positioning of like the big tech companies or like, I mean, we've, it, any any views on like, I mean, it seems like Microsoft is so so strong here, but like any views on where Apple or Facebook are? And also just like related to that, like how you're advising your startups to strike deals for like long-term like compute sort of contracts. Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I think your observation is correct, where if you look at the playing field today, you'd give Microsoft a ton of credit, Google's number two. There are others as well, right? Like Oracle's playing an important role as well. And then it's actually surprising to us some of the names you mentioned are, are kind of nowhere to be found. Um, and so I would expect we see, we see them realize that they're behind and make moves to catch up. But to date, uh, those three companies have been, have been the best to partner with. And we have different companies in our portfolio. Microsoft, Google, Oracle. Yeah, that's right. On the you, cloud side. And, I mean, you have a number, like Workspace is a user of your product or like what, yeah, what are, what's your sort of partnership strategy? I think right now, um, a lot of companies that make software tools um, sort of are in a really interesting, really interesting moment where I think there's the ability for them to offer something to end users that's like a way easier way to go use the same thing while still letting experts like be fully functional in 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 their software. Right? Like people who like know and love, I don't know, just choose choose an example, right? Something like something like uh, uh, something like like Workday. Like they know how to go get everything done, right? Um, but I think at the same time, for people who may not know how to use use the software as well, I think having something like Adept that makes it possible to for them to just put in language what they need to get done in the tool gives a lot of leverage to the end user and cuts down the need for like for 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 the L&D budget, right? And so I think that has made it natural for us to go work with a lot of companies that way. I'm gonna open this up in a second. Uh, this is a, I, I just wanna go back to an earlier question in that I feel like I asked you whether you trust OpenAI and the answer was somewhat, everybody else will be able to catch up. And yeah, is that the right inference that in some ways your answer was not yes? So I think on that in particular, I think OpenAI, like I spent a ton of time at OpenAI helping build um, the safety team and the policy team, which ended up rolling up to me. So really, really enjoy a lot of the folks who are who are who are who are steering that steering that ship over there. I think at the end of the day, like though, I still still th believe like most importantly that like this is still really early, weirdly enough, in the story of AI, and I think that um, there's a lot. Uh, that's gonna, there's a lot that's gonna happen when the rubber hits the road on the stuff. And I actually think that's gonna be a disproportionate amount of influence that the community is gonna have in terms of what happens. Any questions? Great, yep. Uh, here, here we go. Introduce yourself. I'm Jammin. Um, an earlier panelist talked about helpful, honest, and harmless being kind of the three pillars of, Anthropic. Con yeah, of constitutional AI. If you had to rate each of those where we are today on a scale of one to 10, where would you put it? Um, I, think that the, I think that helpful is an intent, and I think all the models intend to be helpful. Um, I think the degree to which they're actually helpful, it's still very early. I mean, it's just like the action space for, for AI systems should be like, should be such that they can help you with a lot more stuff than, than writing text. And I think we now see new signs of people calling APIs, I think that's a really great direction. Um, I think that um, I think that as a whole, this uh, for the other two parts, they really come from learning from human feedback. And I think that um, this is still relatively under tapped. Right, the only way we used to train models is we like, like we like hit scale until something broke, and then we and then and then we we put it out there. Um, but I think that like being able to learn from learn from users like to like follow human preferences is going to close a lot of the gap on the latter two. What a I mean, you, you spent like a year at Google, right? Or yeah, after OpenAI. I mean, what, there's definitely like a meme online that it's like OpenAI, they're there till like 3 a.m. like grinding it out and like Google, you know, it's like the show Silicon Valley, like on the roof. Like, I don't know, how, how true is that? Um, so at OpenAI, we definitely had our nine to fives. We also had our people who just like really pushed hard. Um, I would say at Google, there was, there was also some of the latter, but definitely the ratio is slightly different. 
I was there during during peak COVID though. Oh, okay. So um, so it's hard to tell over. Zoom. And any takeaways on sort of the mer you know like it seems like Google Brain there's a sort of a merger within the organizations within Google. Do you think that's significant? So for a long time, I always said that that would be the sign that Google is really mobilizing. <laughs> They're awake. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's happened. Right. As far as, I mean, I don't have any inside information on right. that, but from what I can tell, like, I think that was a really big, I think that's, that's just like, that's where, that's where the stuff needs to go. Any other questions? Howdy. Great. Yeah. Hey, thanks y'all. Um, I'm, J I'm John, I'm a founder, and it seems kind of blindingly obvious that we're moving into a new paradigm where like the cloud native companies are now gonna be competing with like these kind of new AI native companies. And can you kind of unpack what you um, to spoke about with Workday, where you're offering them kind of a escape path to not be displaced by an a AI native version? Like to what degree is that kind of the core, would you kind of frame that as the core opportunity that you're working on? And can you talk more specifically about like what it's gonna take for these companies that have built been built natively into the cloud to kind of compete in this new paradigm? I think Sam's a much better person to comment on. I'll say one quick thing, which is that like I think that like a lot of the opportunities right now come from which things should be unbundled because of AI and which things should be bundled because of AI. And I think that like for, for like for working with Workday, for example, it's a perfect example of where like like the like product shape I think is actually very good. Um, and so as a result, like working together makes a lot of sense. But I think in other areas, I think vertical SaaS, that's AI first, due to bundling or unbundling could do really well. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add to that is, like, the lens I use is where is their real gravity? So if you take something like Workday, there's immense gravity in the data and the fact that they're a system of record for your employees. And then the opportunity for AI is to reimagine the workflows and interfaces on top of that gravity. And like David was alluding to this, but I think it's a more general point. Most people think of AI, they think, oh, I'm gonna make people who know how to do something more efficient. And that's definitely a big part of it. It also like, is a much more elegant and accessible interface for a lot of workflows. And so what actually ends up happening is there's a lot of latent demand for people who want to be able to operate on these systems but who can't because they don't understand uh, or don't have the sophistication or training to use them in their current form. But they know how to talk to a natural la language interface oriented assistant who can help them use Workday or Sheets or whatever. And so I think it ends up also expanding the TAM of people who can interact with these systems. Do you think that companies that build their cost structures natively in an AI world uh, are just going to blow away. Do you think, I guess flipping that, do you think companies that are, have built their cost structures in a cloud native world will be able to compete with companies that have built their cost structures AI first? I, I don't fully know what you mean by cost structure, but, but I would say like, I think there's going to be a lot of variance around whether or not companies are able, like cloud native companies will be able to compete in an AI native world versus not. It's very company specific. Great. Well, I took away, you know, we, we've had our trans transistor moment already in AI, which is pretty crazy to think about. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks. Yep.